On this episode with the brilliant New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and radio host, Eric Metaxas, we are talking about the spiral of silence in our culture, where we are asked to be tolerant to those who are not tolerant of Christians and to quiet our truth. We discuss persecution of Christians in our world and how fear of Facebook and Twitter arguments or speaking out against the masses has great potential to hinder the work of the gospel. Eric is discussing church versus state, the damage of cultural Marxism, defining people as what they are, race, sexuality, rather than who they are. He shares about Caitlyn Jenner, loving your enemies, and how truth is the currency of God. If you want to learn, grow, and love Jesus and the gospel even more, you will love this episode. Welcome to All The Things, the unscripted podcast where we talk to intriguing people from a variety of cultures, backgrounds, and career paths and deconstruct who they are and why they think the way that they do. We dig deep and ask unexpected questions to learn about all the things, from faith and current events to relationships and mental health. We want to satisfy your craving for knowledge, true connection, and real conversation. This is Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay Maestas. everyone. Welcome back to the All The Things podcast. This is Lindsay Maestas, and I am here with Lenya Heitzig and our guest, New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and radio host, Eric Metaxas. We're thrilled. We're yes. excited. Like, we're not worthy. I don't yes. know if we're going. Oh, I think we've both, been, nah, we've both been very nervous out. about this conversation. You stop. So you things stop. I wrote, Just cut it out. What I wrote down, Renaissance man. Well, I, I would say uh, that... Uh, <laughs> That about sums it up. <laughs> there you I, go. That's a really nice way of saying <laughs> scattered, right? It's But it's my husband. And I really believe you guys are kindred spirits in the sense that vast libraries, you know, vibrant intellects, mm. interested in so many different topics. Mm-hmm. And so that does fit some people. I'm yeah. appreciative of your cultural influence. I love that you are pushing back mm-hmm. at a culture. And um, for me... Sometimes you get this picture that Christians are stodgy or whatever, Pat Boone, slick back hair, and you have white patent leather <laughs> shoes. And I love that you're an academic and a comedian all mm. rolled into one thing. As well, I watch, I, oh, man, go ahead. No, 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 Lindsay. I was say, as I watched your interviews, I was so entertained and I learned so much at the same time. You're just very easy to watch and listen to. Well, you know, that is what I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> because sure. seriously, I, you know, when you're doing a show like I, I mean, maybe people don't even realize, but I have um, a radio show, a podcast, a TV show called The Eric Metaxas Show. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are finding it on YouTube because we film everything. Um, But I've always felt this is bizarre to me, right? Because people, a lot of people know me as he's the author of Bonhoeffer or he worked for Veggie Tales or so. I don't know, you know, whatever it is. But I've always known, especially since I became a believer 30 years ago, that God has called me to do you know, like the Dick Cavett show or mm. Johnny Carson. or that. I've always known that. Mm. But what's bizarre is that years and years and years and years, I never did it, but I knew that that's God's calling. And now that I'm doing it, as when I started doing it, people said, oh, you're really, really good at this. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm really glad you're saying that because who knew? I didn't know if I would be good at it. I just knew that I, I, was, I felt called to do it. But the point is that it gives you an opportunity if you're if you're eclectic, if you have really varied interests. When you're interviewing all these different people day after day, I mean if you go to the YouTube Eric Pentaxis show site and you look you you just realize, wow, like this is a lot of it's not, you know, there's some political people, there's some faith people, you know, a lot of political people, a lot of faith people, but then there's historians and singers and da 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 da. da. And I thought that's the only way I could function is if I'm able to talk about completely different things from one mm. day to the next. If I had to do politics every day or if I had to do faith stuff every day, I would get bored quickly. Right. So it's it's just weird to me that now I'm finally doing the the thing that for years I have known that I was going to do. And I am thrilled that you you are in you know that In-tuned you that you that, enjoyed that it. it. When you when you saw it, because, mm. you know, what do I know? I One mean, of the so. ways we know we're in our gifting and in our calling, of course, there's this divine prompting. You know, you know, you're prompted to do it. You said you felt this. And then um, the other thing is that uh, you, you know, have the unction to do it. But it's also when the public, 
when people can yeah. kind of affirm and yeah. say, you know what, yeah. you're in your sweet spot. That's right, yeah. And so it's really a neat way for the Lord to just kind of go, yeah, that's where you belong, buddy. Amen. Um, New York Times bestseller, we're not done here, author, <laughs> speaker, no, I, we won't go on and on. But um, Eric was in town in uh, New Mexico this week. And uh, he was uh, speaking last night, and something just blew my mind. And I'm fascinated with so many varying things as well. And one of those is underlying undercurrents of culture. And and why does it change? And what's happening? And, you know, you see things declining, and you go, oh, well, I guess, you know, it must be MTV. Well, wait a minute. That was the 80s. But (laughs) or whatever. whatever It must be the Beatles. It must be the Beatles. It's rap singers. (laughs) Whatever the latest thing is. And you brought up this comment. and you said a cultural Marxist. Yeah. And my head literally swiveled up like, what? What is that? Yeah. And um, so I was fascinated, and I just thought it'd be neat for the audience to understand what you mean when you say well, cultural Marxism. Well, I'm not going to pretend like I know a ton about cultural Marxism, but here's the bottom line. We defeated the Soviet Union. In 89, the wall came down. In 91, the Soviet Union broke apart. That had been the Cold War in which we were engaged since the beginning of time, since all of us were born. It's just the thing that was there forever. Communism, evil, totalitarian, atheistic communism that was incredibly oppressive. And I knew the evil of it because my mother grew up in what became East Germany. She left there because she could feel the oppression. She hated it. My father grew up in Greece where there was a civil war with the communists right after the First World War. So I was raised to hate communism. And I even went over in 1971 when I was a kid. My mom took me over to see the relatives in East Germany. And I saw the grayness and the oppression. And it is evil. But if you've never seen it, you don't know that. So for people who hated communism, suddenly in 1989 and then in 91, you think, hey, Reagan and Thatcher and John Paul II prevailed. God prevailed over godless communism. But... We know, living in a fallen world, that's not the way it works. The satanic forces behind godless communism in the Soviet Union, um, they don't go away. Those thrones and dominions and principalities don't go away. And so what really happened was it shifted to what we can now call cultural Marxism. Now that They were was, marketing their ideas. Ideas well, matter, basically. That well, I mean, the law this, came down, but the ideas came over? The, the, or? The, well, I would say that, the, that this has been with us all along. There's a lot, we're talking about a lot of stuff at once. But the bottom line is that l- – let's just look at it this way. There's a biblical worldview, right, mm-hmm. which I would say – I was talking about it last night. In my book, If You Can Keep It. I, I learned a number of things about America. That's what why I wrote the book, If You Can Keep It. I, I was reading Oz Guinness, and I start to understand some things. And one of the things I understood that is that God wants us to be free, to govern ourselves. It's it's a, you know, it has something to do with the gospel and with Jesus and everything. But the point is that it's it doesn't mean you just have a form of government. The people themselves have to be virtuous. So if we are all living for Jesus, we can govern ourselves, right? If we're all virtuous people, we can govern ourselves. But if the people aren't virtuous, doesn't mean they have to be Christians, but why would they govern themselves? In history, we've had to be governed by somebody, you know, pointing a sword or a gun at us, basically. And that's been the history of mankind. So suddenly in 1776, the founders understand that if we have a virtuous populace, And a virtuous populace usually means a religious populace, which we had in the 18th century because of George Whitfield and the First Great Awakening. You had a lot of Christians, a lot of revival and stuff. That's not the only thing, but it really is necessary. It helps put you over the edge where you say, we can do this and there's going to be a culture of virtue. Even if not everyone is virtuous, even if not everyone knows why they're virtuous, it becomes part of the culture. So I began to understand that when when you have virtue in democracy. Democracy works. Now, democracy without virtue means we can elect Adolf Hitler. We can elect the devil. We don't, just because we can vote means nothing, right? Yes. The same thing with the free market. The free market will deliver incredible things. But if the people in the free market want bad things, if we just want better pornography and drugs, the free market will give us whatever we want. And so I started to think about that. And I started to think that when this works right, it increases wealth, it increases freedom. It's It's been something that almost 250 years we've had it in America, and it has blessed the whole world, frankly. I mean, we've been able to do do so much. Now, the opposite side of this is the idea that says people aren't free. The state is going to govern you. It's going to tell you what to do. But in order for that to work, in order for that evil to work, you have to convince people that it's a war 
us versus them. Those are the rich people. We are the workers. We're the poor people. We're oppressed. We hate them. And we have permission by this, you know, what do they call it? The dialectical view, right? Us versus them, us versus them. We have permission to hate the oppressor. And so that's what made Soviet communism and communism work because you say you're oppressed, you're the workers. But if you listen to us, we will help you to get what's coming to you. We will help you just do what we tell you to do. So, and you can see that current in, yes, in our own society. That's socialism today. When I looked it up today, the Marxist culture, culture or whatever, is that when the ruling class, the elites, whoever they are, um, they manipulate culture with their beliefs, perceptions, values, so that those others, they um, don't want to talk about their ideology. Okay, you know what so, I mean? They're, they're suppressed well, for what, whatever reason. D- just just to, to complete my, my very, very long thought. So if you think about this. It's an economic dialectic. We say they're rich, we're poor, we're the workers, and we need to have a revolution. Okay, but if all that goes away, 1991, Soviet Union breaks up, okay, now what? Well, now you simply shift this idea of us versus them, and you make it not about the the proletariat and the workers and stuff. You now make it about whatever else, okay? Mm -hmm. Black versus white, male versus female. Feminism. Who's the oppressed class? So you, you, you now come up with... A new oppressed class, it, it doesn't have anything to do w- with economics or at least not as much as it used to. It still manifests itself in distributionism or redistributionism, right? In other words, somebody has something that I want. Maybe it's money, but it's also now power, right? So white males have power. We, anybody else. Got to take it to any, man. Anybody else, yeah. whether I'm a woman or I'm a minority or whatever I am, I'm oppressed And now I'm given permission. This is exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches. I'm given permission to hate a group Mm -hmm. because I say they're the powerful group. They have made me suffer. They have made my people suffer. I hate you and I have to hate you and I love hating you and I can revel in despising you and wanting to crush you. When you can get people to think that way, it is incredibly powerful. We tumble into tribalism. Yeah. That's, you know, that's you really exactly get down to what, the very that, that's exactly bottom of that. What it is. You have a divisive world, and now we're all in tribes, and there's no, you know, the great American experiment was we homogenized, right? If you had German parents or that's right. you had Greek parents or Polish or Italian, whoever they were, we came and we had this great dream that, you know, out of the many won. Right. And so we had this beautiful melting pot. But now if you start separating everybody into their own subcategories and you have to get ahead, then you can really see how this cultural Marxism is dividing our nation. We are the one percent or the. Well, well, that's the point. And it manifests manifests itself in so many different ways that it's kind of confusing. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, first of all, if we're Christians, we can all say if you give yourself permission to hate somebody. You're not behaving the way Jesus wants you to behave. You know that, right? So it doesn't matter, even if it's true that you're being oppressed, you're supposed to pray for your enemies. It doesn't mean you're supposed to let them keep hurting you, but you're supposed to love your enemies and pray for your enemies and understand that, but for the grace of God, you would be them, right? So it's giving yourself permission to hate and then to go to war with another group. And if you believe you're justified, then you also believe the end's justify the means. If I have to lie, if I have to use violence, it makes no difference if I have to cheat whatever I can do to get the upper hand because I don't believe in truth. I believe in power. Mm -hmm. And I believe even that talking about truth, that's a patriarchal construct. That's just been used to oppress me. I'm done with that. I just want to get power. That's kind of where we are today. Now, left-wing politics today has gone there. It was not there. When John F. Kennedy was president, he said the opposite. He said, you know, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. That's like a conservative idea. That's a deep American idea. We've had a de-evolution. Martin Luther King wanted us to do it passively, you know, that we would have sit-ins or go to the counter or Rosa Parks or whoever. There wasn't this, you know, way that we were going to be Because aggressive. he was a Christian. Exactly. That's the point. He was a Christian. And he said, we're not going to fight back. We're going to be like Jesus. We're going we're gonna to make them see that we have um, moral superiority because we're not going to fight back. And peop- that's going to freak out a nasty guy like Bull Connor. If you don't fight back, they're going to be like, what? what's going on? It's almost like maybe God is in you or behind you because that we're not used to that. We're used to people fighting, right? So that's, that's something that you know. When the 60s, there was this tumult, and that way of changing things kind of lost out. 
And so the nastiness we see today, we were just talking earlier about when people lie. It's happened to me, right, where I wrote my biography of Bonhoeffer. And in writing the book, I realized that a lot of the people who had kind of been guarding his legacy for 50 years, they had been covering up some stuff. But I didn't know that until I kind of found it, right? So in my book, it's not like I go out of my way to write about that. But in in the course of just telling his story in his own words, it kind of shows a lot of the Bonhoeffer scholars to be not exactly unbiased, right? Well, of course, you know, if you're like a VeggieTales writer or a conservative and you dare to go up against academics, they're going to hate you. And so they said a number of things about my book that are just completely lies. But what I noticed is people don't care. They repeat it over and mm-hmm. over and over and over. And you're like, well, it, in other words, no matter, even if I tried to have a conversation and say like, wait a minute, show me where in my book I said this or this or this or this. They can't, but they're just angry. They hate you. Maybe they're jealous because they're academics and their book sells, you know, 4,000 copies and my book sold a million copies. And they think, how dare you come onto my turf and whatever. I mean, it happened to C.S. Lewis, mm-hmm. you know, in, in it, it happened. I'm not comparing myself to C.S. Lewis, I hope. But the point is that that kind of nastiness, if you don't really believe in uh, fighting fair, you will repeat a lie over and over and over. And that is part of cultural Marxism that they say, look, we're here to win. We're not here to play nice. We don't care. And by the way, we believe you're a capitalist pig that's been oppressing us from the beginning of time. And you're darn right. We're going to. So so they're talking about socialism. They're talking about all this kind of stuff. You think, where did this come from? It's been there. Mm-hmm. But something about this current president has kind of forced it. It's like flushed the bird out, you know, of the yes. bushes. And so suddenly we're seeing this this kind of madness. And I think for a lot of people who don't like conflict, it's very tough. Like they just, they don't know how to deal with it. But I think first we have to understand what is happening. Uh, we have to understand how things work. The reason I wrote my book, If You Can Keep It, was I said, even I was not raised to understand what is the right way that America is supposed to work? What What is this government we have? Is it better? How does it work? When does it not work? What is happening to our country right now so that it's kind of not working? Why did we stop teaching this in schools. We used to teach this in schools. We don't teach right. it in schools So anymore. one of the other comments you made that kind of leads into this for us is you were talking about this cultural Marxism and suppressing truth and the ruling class brings out this new thing and everybody's shouting it. Um, you talked about the spiral of silence. Yeah. And that was like such another way of saying, OK, if we who know the truth, like you said, I might have written 100,000 books and the other guy sent a million, but I can say the truth all day long. But other people aren't willing to stand up, speak the truth, whatever it is, so that we are complicit, so to speak, if we keep silent. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, one of the great heroes of the 20th century, one of the true heroes of history, who uh, wrote the book The Gulag Archipelago, revealing the horrors and the tortures of the Soviet Union prison system, all of that. He once said, I think he was repeating an old Russian proverb, he said, One word of truth outweighs the world. Truth is, that's the currency of God, truth. And when you speak a word of truth or or a statement of truth, and if you speak it in love, it has incredible power, but it comes with a price, okay? Jesus was truth and he was crucified. So, you know, you're not gonna win contests for speaking the truth, but what happens in cultures, it happened in Germany. That's where Tarkolson yes. figured out this phrase, the spiral of silence. And I see it happening now. Basically, if there's a cultural price, right? In other words, if everybody is starting to become Nazi, I realize, okay, now if I'm going to, if I'm going to say, I don't want to join the Nazi party, or I'm going to say, I don't like Hitler, I'm going to realize now there's a price in the beginning before he came to power, I could say anything I want, but every day that passes, it becomes a little bit tougher as the Nazis accrue power and your friends and people are, you know, people are losing jobs and stuff. So it comes with a price. So if you speak up, any person who speaks the truth in that kind of a climate does huge damage to the lie. And then people hear you speak the truth and they go, whoa, so-and-so said that. I guess maybe I can say it. I get a little courage and I can say it. But it works just the opposite, that if I shut up, right? I mean, if somebody says, you know, you must say that Bruce Jenner is a woman. He's not Bruce Jenner. He's a he's a woman now named Caitlyn Jenner. And I would say, wait a minute, that's kind of complicated. I understand he wants to be called Caitlyn. I understand he wants to be a woman, but I, you can't say that he is. You know, I can't see it that way. 
And people would say like, well, if you don't toe the line on this, you're going to lose your job. If you don't toe the line on this, you're going to be cast out of that club. You you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be whatever it is. Okay. So, so a lot of people who don't really know what the truth is, they go along with it. They say, you know what? I don't want to rock the boat. I want to keep my friends. I want to keep my house. I want to keep my job. So I'm just not going to say anything. When that happens, because that's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany, when people start doing that, like they're just like today, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. It gets harder and harder and harder to say anything because the other side keeps winning. The more you speak, the easier it is to everybody to speak. The more you keep silent, the more it, it's, it becomes difficult. So Chuck Colson got this from a sociologist who, who had studied Germany during that time. But that term, the spiral of silence, it's it's a perfect illustration of where we are today. And my friend John Zmierik, I have him on my radio show all the time, at least once a week. But he said that it's just like Orwell's book, 1984. Mm. Uh, the party wants to force you to say that two plus two equals five. Yes. Now, yeah. you know, two plus two equals four. But the party says you can't know anything unless we tell you we're going to tell you what is truth and what is false and we're telling you that unless we can force you to say two plus two equals five, you're too independent. You're thinking for Consummate yourself. Consummate peer pressure, okay? right? That's if all that, your that's, peers are saying yes. it's five, yeah. you know, and who so, am I? So now we're there in America where my friend John Zmierik said saying two plus two equals four in that context is the equivalent to saying uh, Bruce Jenner is a man. You can't say that. And you say, well, I know I'm not supposed to say that, except here's the problem. Like it's true, right. like of course he's a man. I he remember has a y him. Chromosome. I, re I mean, yes, you can you can take a drop of blood, and you can tell that he's a man. Now he's got his issues, and we should, you know, I, as a Christian, I would pray for him, and I would I would love to put my arm around him and and befriend him and help him understand that you know God loves you and whatever. But you can't get me to say that he's a woman just because he's not a woman. That kind of pressure that we're feeling in our culture right now. We all know that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't feel that. It's gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. And as people don't speak up, as people say, oh, I don't wanna rock the boat, it becomes easier for this cultural Marxist trend to gain power. And we're in a real war right now. Well, and I'd like to touch on that because the word of the year and the word of 2019 was tolerance. Yeah. And you hear that so much that we are asked to be tolerant of these people. And kind of going back to cultural Marxism, it's almost as if summing up what you were saying is it's not even about the value of who we are anymore. It's about what we are and what we believe. And we're reduced to these arbitrary characteristics of am I gay? Am I? And that is how we are defined. Am I woke? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, but it, get, it gets to what we were talking about. This new reality is trying to carve us up into categories. Right. When you say I'm an American, they go, no, you're not American. You're a white male. Yeah. And I go, no, no, no. I'm just, I'm an American. Mm. And they said, no, no, no. You're a uh, native American. No, you are uh, Latina. You are colored. Right. A person of color. By the way, listen to this. Now there's discrimination, but as things get divided mm -hmm. up, the, I was just talking to a friend of mine who was, uh, he was talking to somebody to, making a film. And they were talking about the film, uh, Harriet Tubman film, okay? And my friend is black and his friend is black and they're having this conversation. And, and my friend's friend said, yeah, and the woman who played Harriet Tubman didn't deserve to play that role because she is not a descendant of slaves. In other words, it's not good enough that she's a great actress, that she's black. She is not Her a descendant of slaves. So then they're carving up that. Mm -hmm. So it gets crazier and crazier. But that is the madness of that way of seeing the world. Right. And that's why we have to say when you, somebody says tolerance, we have to call it out. That's a garbage term. It's a meaningless word. If you cannot tolerate me right. having a biblical worldview, you're what's called a hypocrite. Well, yeah. and that's what I want to hear your perspective on that, because we are called to be taller, asked to be tolerant of everyone else. But because we disagree with the tolerance, of every, we are then intolerant. And so in the regard to the spiral of silence, I think it's important for us, especially my generation, voters to speak up, as you're saying, speak up, speak the truth. Don't be afraid to share. But how how do you go about that when you just get brutally attacked for speaking your mind? I, I think you have to really know who you are. It's if good. you just want to be liked, you will never win. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to know who you are and you have to know what is truth. And you have to understand that since the beginning of time, people have died for the right thing. Right. Jesus died. He could have lived a long life. He could have mm -hmm. had grandchildren and great-grandchildren. He chose 
to let them kill him for God, for God's purposes. Right. And we all are called. Bonhoeffer says when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. You die to self and you realize that life is not worth living unless I can be free. And if people are telling me what to say and how to live and what to like and what not to like and what words to use, what not to use, we all have to understand that everyone is faced with choices. When when uh, 1776 happened, right, a lot of people said, you know what, I, I don't want to get involved in this, mm-hmm. right? And then there are other people who gave their lives Fighting for, for freedom. It. Yeah. And just, uh, you know, a few decades ago, people gave their lives to fight against Adolf Hitler. You could have been like the Swiss and just say, like, you know what, I'm just going to groove on the rubble. I'm not going to get involved. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not the that's not the way to live. And even now in America, we have to understand that the freedoms that we have, they come with a price. And unless you know, I mean, I actually would say as a Christian, unless you know God is with you, it's very hard to find the strength to be free and to, to speak the truth. It's already difficult even if you are a Christian. But we, we have to realize that people have died for their faith. People have died because they refused to put a pinch of incense to worship the emperor in, in Roman times. They said, I won't do that. All they had to do is a little nothing. What's the big deal? And they said, no, I won't do it. I am free. I worship Jesus. I will not I will not worship another God. And, and they said, well, we're going to kill you. And they said, well, we don't care because guess what? We know the little secret. I'm already dead. I am dead in Christ. I was crucified yeah. with Christ and I will live forever. I'm not afraid of death. You know, that's that was Bonhoeffer's Sadly, secret. Every Christian yeah. who's really a Christian, you need to know that and you need to, to to live that way, which is why I write books about people like Bonhoeffer because I think we need an we need inspiration, we need encouragement. This doesn't come naturally to us. I mean, persecution we know it doesn't. clarifies, doesn't it? Because if you go back to people who become persecuted people, the church they they develop a backbone. You mm-hmm. know, there are certain things that call out to the better angels of our nature, if you will, that they're really calling us up. To that, and uh, our persecution is so minimal in America. But, but see, I mean, that's we're the thing is, cush. if you start acquainting yourself with the persecution of people around the world, yes. it really changes your perspective. Mm-hmm. I did a thing on my radio show, a fundraiser for CSI Christian Solidarity International. Right now, while we're having this conversation in this nice room, there are people who, because they are Christians in Sudan, are genuinely enslaved. Mm-hmm. Like when we say enslaved, we think like, "What do you mean, like trafficked?" Or no, 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 enslaved, like ripped away from their family, raped, Mm -hmm. forced to do labor, beaten. This goes on for years and years and years. They are slaves because a radical fundamentalist Muslim worldview says slavery is totally permissible. Uh, If you're a Christian or you're not my particular brand of, of Muslim, I can enslave you. So that's literally going on now. And the more I thought about this, I thought, wow, people are absolutely suffering all around the world for their faith. And like, I'm afraid that somebody's going to say something nasty to me on Twitter mm-hmm. or But where or is whatever. the six o'clock news going back into the spiral oh, of silence? Forget it. So I do work in Iraq <laughs> with the Reload Love. And if you go back to Iraq, Saddam Hussein, there were two million Christians in Iraq. Today, there are less than 200,000. So in my lifetime, in your lifetime, and as I go to visit at Katakush, a city that's completely abandoned, the largest Christian community that was in the region, and they're chased away, I never thought I would be alive when there'd be a Christian persecution, genocide. Actually, let's call it what it really is. It's yeah. not just persecution. This is yeah. genocide. And you don't hear anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many pulpits are yelling that out? How many people on the street or the news? And it's this spiral oh, the of silence. The, the news, they, they only cover. I mean, look, we have to we have to explain some things. When when we were younger, I'm, I'm talking to Lenya now. But like, <laughs> we remember actual news, news and journalism. OK, it makes me sick to say it, but we have to be honest. That went away. We now have money making, uh, and I'm not being cynical. I'm just saying this has evolved over time so that you have news outlets that are basically, they're making money by Machines. kind of representing a certain narrative or a point of 24 view. 24 hour news And cycle. so they're mm-hmm. going to give you, but this is the irony. Now we have 24 hour news and they cover the same stuff over, over and, and over, over and over and over. And they don't talk about like what we're talking about now. Mm-hmm. This, this is staggeringly important stuff. Never mentioned on any network. And so on my radio program, obviously, I try to talk about this stuff, but it's a scandal that there are people all around the world suffering. I mean, think about China. You have over a billion people now under the boot of a totalitarian dictatorship. 
the United States very foolishly under Clinton. We said, oh, we're going to be we're going to play patty cake with them and we're going to give them most favored nation status and it's going to be good, good, good. What we enable them to do is become really, really powerful to oppress their people even more effectively than they did before 1997 or whatever we, we gave them. Christians, they're setting up the whole table to persecute Christians in the, China. And that's, that's why I brought it up. All because the, the Christians, laws are changing yeah. and it's going to be horrible. Yeah. And have you see, seen it on the news? Have you seen one word about no. this on the news? And then you have the head of the NBA, these people who are making zillions of dollars. They don't have the courage. This is sick. They're making millions of dollars off of the American system. They didn't have the courage to say the people in Hong Kong who are protesting for freedom against communism, which is trying to crush them. China is trying to crush them. We can't even support have the them. guts to support them on Twitter or something because we don't want to lose a penny as the NBA making zillions of dollars in China. And you start saying, folks, th that's behaving like a prostitute. You'll do anything. Would you do business with the Nazis if you could make money? Or, or do you have a moral boundary that says, you know what? If I'm making money off of, of Jews being like murdered, you know, I can't do that. OK, if I'm making money off slavery, I can't do that. When you're doing business in China, you've got to think about the fact that, hey, is this OK or am I pouring money into an evil system? I'm not saying it's a, it's an easy answer, but we have a moral responsibility. Yep. Like, what is your price tag? What, how, what, how much what can is you your, be And bought? we saw that the NBA, that, that these They're, guys, these are like smart guys. They do not have a clue no moral of what the, well, I think it's both like some of them, I would just say it's pure ignorance. ignorance. They do not have a clue of how the world works and how their ability to make millions and whatever, like where that comes from, what, they have no clue. And then there are others who maybe they have a clue and they do think like, you know what? I don't care if somebody's, if some peasant in China is being oppressed so I can get like a gigantic sneaker deal. Frankly, I don't care. Somebody else is going to make that money. I might as well make that money. I mean, if that's your attitude, you do not have morality. So there's a lot of mitigating factors that cause this spiral of silence, whether it's financial or being a social pariah or whatever it is. And the purveyors of that, you know, if we're saying there's a cultural Marxism, then a spiral of silence, the purveyors in the United States, is that like Hollywood, universities, the media? Where oh. is that coming well, from? Well, it's coming from like, yeah, just about everywhere at this point. And I think that, but, you know, but remember- the truth is so powerful that one person speaking the truth outweighs 20 people lying. I mean, I know that. You see that. Mm -hmm. And so right now, universities, it's just, it's taken over. It was there. When I was at Yale in the early and mid-80s, it was there. Wait, you went where? Str Str Yale University, which is one of the worst <laughs> of what we're talking about. Are you sure you want to it's, say that it's on one a of Christian the worst. Podcast? It's one of the worst places in terms of this kind of stuff. And I'm not going to get into it. I talk about all this stuff in my radio program all the time. But the point is that. It was already there then. And I come out of a working class background, European immigrant parents who taught me to love America and everything. And you kind of suddenly come into this environment and you think, what? Like all the elites who live on Park Avenue, New York, they, they sort of hate America and they sort of, you know, and that's when I first saw it. And it's gotten worse and worse. So the university's madness has basically taken over. And you should think twice before you ever, first of all, give a dime to any university, I well, wouldn't, I wouldn't I think do it. One thing you find is, at least in the people that I communicate with, is a lot of the time they don't have any real backing to what they believe or to what they understand. And we were talking about exceptionalism. That's right. right. That America, I have people who travel all over the world and come back saying, make no mistake, America is an incredible country. It's entitlement that we are experiencing. And so we lose sight of right. the greatness of it all and then go from misunderstanding or ignorance to immediate hate. Hatred. Well, because I'm a Christian, like I believe in truth, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean... I believe in my truth. I believe in truth. I believe in the reality that God created. And the reality that God created, a lot of times uh, I will discover stuff that goes against maybe what I wanted to think. But I go, but that's that's true. So, you know, whether it's through science or something, there's this reality that God created. And we're supposed to use our minds to understand what is true. And when you have a view that you're so fixed to, right, mm -hmm. you don't want to hear any arguments you don't care right. if there's not, because at the bottom line, you don't believe in truth. You don't believe in truth. Mm -hmm. If people believe in, in real truth, 
They're going to connect the dots where they go, and they're not afraid because they know that God is the author of truth, and I don't have to be afraid of what truth is going to reveal. Well, you can't even get the truth on a college campus because conservatives well, can't even get on the campus to uh, have uh, a free th- discourse. To, to even have a conversation. <laughs> but, but, I mean, the funny thing is, though, you know, Scripture, J- Jesus says, cast ye not your pearls before swine. A lot of people who just want to get in debates all the time, Yeah, God doesn't call us to debate. You could have all the facts. It doesn't mean there's not a time. But you could have every single fact, every single argument. There are people they simply don't care. And you're not supposed to waste your breath, you know, and your God-given talent and time arguing with somebody like Mm -hmm. that. You know, if somebody wants to hear the truth, you can have a conversation. But if somebody doesn't want to hear it, you know, you shake the dust off your sandals and you find somebody who does want to hear it. But Jesus said you'll know they are Christians by their love, Mm -hmm. not by their debate skills, right? And so the early church, it, you know, they were in a Roman empire that was definitely anti-Christian, right? But this early church, they were the ones that would go out and take orphan babies off the street because there were no orphanages. They are the ones that would bandage the wounds of centurions who were killing them. They were the ones that uh, would, when a plague hit, go in and take care of the sick. And um, so their love was a testimony, not just the truth, but the love. The truth Mm -hmm. compelled them to live loving lives. Right. And within 300 years, the religion of Rome changed, right? And (laughs) so what changed it? Was it their debating skills or was it their skills of compassion and love and living out the truth? It's, I mean, and you you need uh, all of that. In other words, I think that it's, it's kind of like, let's say I say, hey, listen. It, the, the facts don't matter unless the Holy Spirit moves on somebody. Nothing can happen. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't have the arguments or the facts, right. or because because all that stuff does matter. But the question is, is somebody interested in those facts? I can write a book on apologetics. I think it's really important. But you can't argue somebody into the kingdom. Their heart has to want the truth. And so all this stuff is, you know, it's 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 a little complicated. But it's at the end of the day, it's not complicated. It's just that God's way. Is not carnal. You cannot you, you right. cannot force Spirit. somebody with the facts because there are plenty of people they simply don't care about the facts. And well, you, you have modern, to pray for them. Yeah. You know? In modern day America too, there's something to be said for face to face conversation versus social media conversation. Right. Right. Because yeah. nobody is going onto Facebook or to Twitter to actually hear a point of view and a perspective. And so to show up for people, to show up and love them and serve them and just be the hands and feet of Jesus rather than let me spew all of this information onto you, beat you with the Bible over the head, rather than showing up and loving them, I think is very different. And it's important for us to have that perspective, to have that um, heart to not only just influence, but also to show them what it means to love Christ and Speaking to actually the truth know Christ. and love right. is what scripture would say. But that yeah. leads me, you know, as we're in this whole thing to your book, if you can keep it. Because what you were talking about, if you want to keep this democracy, this beautiful experiment, this amazing thing that gives us American exceptionalism mm-hmm. yeah. versus socialism, and uh, you're fighting against this uh, silent spiral yeah. thing, you were talking about the influence of Oz Guinness. And uh, that he had written about this uh, golden triangle. Yes. Is that what you the call it? He calls it the golden triangle of freedom. And I'd never heard that before. He wrote a book called uh, A Free People's Suicide. And I read it and I was just like insane. I thought, oh, my God, I was electrified. I thought I've grown up in America and I never learned this stuff. And I'm reading it in his book as a grown man thinking, how have I gotten this far? I'm a Christian. And he's British, I'm a Patriot, right? and Yes. And so... I was so taken with it, I thought, I need to write a book about some of these ideas. But the main thing that I got out of his book that I thought I want, first of all, every American should know this, because this is how our government, self-government, liberty, how it works, is this thing that he calls the golden triangle of freedom. And this is what it is. I'll say it briefly, and then I'll explain it. First of all, it's that self-government or liberty or freedom, whatever you want to call it, requires virtue. Then virtue requires faith. And then back to the other, to the beginning, faith requires freedom. Okay. What does that mean? First of all, self-government liberty can't work unless people are virtuous. In other words, if you want to be, if you don't want to govern yourself, if you want to be governed by a tyrant or a king or a bureaucracy, they're going to tell you what to do. The state's going to tell you what to do. You don't need virtue. You just need to do what they tell you. So if you lived in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, you didn't need to be virtuous. You live by fear. You just said, if I don't do the right thing, I'm going to be tortured and killed. So I'm going to do the right thing. 
Now, for people to govern themselves, to do the right thing without anybody forcing them, you have to have virtue. You yes. listen to a higher authority. You say, I don't care what the government says. The reason I'm not going to murder and steal is because God tells me not to do that. So I'm going to be a virtuous person. I don't need a government to tell me to behave, to govern myself. I'm going to govern myself because I answer to God. Mm. Well, so the founders said, unless you have virtue, and this is all the founders, not a couple of Christian founders, they all understood that our government, our constitution, the whole system doesn't work unless you have a virtuous population, generally speaking. But they also observed that virtue tends to come through faith. They said when people, when revival breaks out, crime goes down, all get, they noticed over and over and over again that where does virtue come from? It tends to come from faith. Not religion. So faith. they said, well, I mean, you know, whatever whatever you want to call it. Right? But I think people would argue that religion causes war and religion causes issues. But what I believe what you're saying is faith, right? Like an actual relationship. It, well, of course. A yeah. re, when I, okay, this gets, this gets to the third part, right? So faith. Then in turn, so you say, okay, freedom requires virtue, virtue requires faith, but faith requires freedom, meaning faith has to be free. We have to be free in America to pursue our faith freely without the government telling us you have to go to that church or you can't go to church. I mean, there's some countries uh, in the world where if you don't go to church, they kind of look at you, well, what's what's wrong with you? Everybody here goes to church or everybody goes to mosque or everybody, but in America, they said we need faith to be totally free because if it's totally free, it will be authentic. It won't be dead religion. It will be real. It will be alive. And they said we have to guard against the state, the government, pushing in, telling people what to believe. Mm. That's a scary thing. Real freedom is scary because you're saying, well, what if they don't believe the right thing? And that's the exact point is that people have to choose the truth and the right thing. But if they choose the God of the Bible— they will govern themselves and whatever, but we cannot make legislation forcing them to believe what the Bible teaches or what, you just can't do it. Whenever it has been done in the past, all the founders, when they established our government, they knew that all over Europe, people were being forced to adopt, you know, that church or that church. And they said, we're not gonna have any of it because we know it doesn't work. Mm. Now, if it worked, maybe they would say, well, okay, we'll, we'll do it. But they knew it can't work. If faith is not free, it's dead. So what I discovered is that at the heart of our system is this thing called virtue. Mm. Now, why isn't virtue taught in schools? Mm -hmm. Why isn't what Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and all the founders said, why isn't it taught in schools? Because it's kind of like a math problem. It's like there's no other way to get there from here. The freedom that we have in America, this amazing freedom that's given us unbelievable wealth and power, and it's made us the greatest country in the history of the world to uh, help others get out of oppression, to send the gospel all around the world. All of that came out of this formula that says at the heart of it, you have virtue and faith. You cannot have American style freedom without virtue and faith. So you'd kind of think like, look, even if you don't like Christianity, even if you hate Christianity, you'd say, well, you know what? They're right. This is how we got all these freedoms and stuff. So uh, I could understand why somebody like Benjamin Franklin, who maybe wasn't an Orthodox Christian, nonetheless said, Without this, what I love can't happen. It can't work. Mm, and good. I was looking up a uh, French diplomat, political scientist, Alexis de Tocqueville. And oh, so he's the key. Uh, he's the key. Right? I write all about him in my book if you okay, can keep good. it. Okay, yeah, good. Well, yeah. he talks about the tyranny of the majority. But his famous quote was, he didn't understand the goodness or how America worked in democracy. He, yes. he gave us kudos for our economic you know, powerhouse right. and for our goodness. But he said, not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits a flame of righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America's great because she is good. Right. And she'll continue to be great as long as she is good. Right. Now, that it's disputed whether he actually said that, but the point is that that perfectly sums up what he did right. He understood that America is this bizarre country, just the opposite of France, where the church actually works hand in hand with freedom. It's not like the church is an authority squelching freedom. In America, the two work hand in hand. And in, in, in my book, if, if you can keep it, I, I quote Tocqueville because this is he observed all this 50 years after 1776 and he was blown away. He's coming from France and he's seeing that faith works in America. Faith increases freedom and freedom increases faith. And like it goes back and forth and back and forth. And it's beautiful. 
And he'd never seen that in France. In France, the church was an oppressive institution. Everybody had to be part of the French Catholic, you know, church. And people just wanted to throw off those shackles. But what did they do? They become militant atheists, which also doesn't give you virtue. Mm -hmm. What's going to give you virtue? Real faith in Jesus, you know, real uh, living faith, not a dead religion, not a church enforced, state enforced way to see things. But actually, Lenya and Lindsay, this is an interesting thing because the founders said we need to keep religion free. We need to keep faith free. So they gave us, you know, what's called freedom of religion, right? And they said uh, the state has to stay out of that stuff, okay? So just as much as the state can't tell you whether to go to church, when to go to church, or it stays out of that, something has changed in our lifetime where the state has now done what the concept, or it's beginning to do what the Constitution says. (laughs) Well, you know, know, to put it in constitutional terms, it says in the Constitution, this is the— the whole freedom of faith, you know, religious liberty issue. It says, it says the government cannot establish a religion. Okay. Now people think that means the government cannot say everybody has to go to Catholic church. Everybody has to go to congregational church. Everybody has to go to this church. No, no, no. What it really means is, I mean, yes, they did mean that, but if you take it to where we are today, it means the government cannot take a stand when it comes to what we would call ultimate issues, right? Sexuality, the human person, all of those things that are the province of what we call faith and religion, the government has to has to remain unbiased and leave people to figure that out on their own. What's happening today? Just the opposite. The government, uh, it started obviously with President Obama, where they are basically saying, if you don't toe the line on this issue of sexuality or same-sex marriage or uh, transgender bathrooms. If you do not toe the line on this view, which is basically antithetical to a biblical view, if you don't toe the line, we will persecute you. Mm-hmm. Which now is they the say cultural Marxism. Oh, that, mm-hmm. That's exactly coming so all the way back to cultural yeah. Marxism. But they say it's not the establishment of a religion. What are you talking about? And I'm here to say that's exactly, according to the founders, that is exactly what they're doing. When they use the power mm-hmm. of the federal government or even the state government to tell us how to live and how to think with regard to human sexuality. I mean, these are the these ideas are the, are the province of faith, okay? Yes. The yes. Bible tells yes. me what it is to be a man or a woman and that God created us male and female in his image to come together to create life in marriage. All that stuff comes from yes. scripture. And so if they say, no, 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 you can't believe that, the government is now doing exactly what the founders said Tearing they must apart. not do. They are establishing what is effectively a religion and an telling example. you socialism and atheism. Right. That- Quickly, Len, and an example of this for our listeners is telling pastors that they must marry yes. same sex yes. couples or they could be secular arrested. Coming into yeah. Religion. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's a that's big, by the way. I, I want to hear what you have to say. But, but what you yeah. just said, Lindsay, that is huge. Yes. The idea that mm-hmm. the government would dare to tell people. No, it's, it's, but this is what we get to the spiral of silence. If people aren't willing to speak out against that, if people wa- aren't will, if people don't have the guts to say, hell no, you we won't. won't go. <laughs> this is America. We're free. You cannot tell me what I need to do. Again. If people don't have the guts to do that, then we deserve what, then we're effectively allowing ourselves to be enslaved. But, but go the ahead. persecution and then we deserve what's coming and, and we might have to die for it. Yeah, and mean, they're so much louder right now. And it's so frustrating because my, my family and I, we'd all talk about that, how much louder these people groups are than Christians. Yes. But I believe what you're saying, Eric, as well is people are beginning to stand yep. up because they're seeing yep. what is happening. They're seeing the fruit of our silence, which is not, not good late. fruit. If right. it's not too late. Yeah. Um, so my dad was yeah. just saying he wanted to know if all communist countries were atheists. Is is, is communism and atheism tied? Ba- basically, yeah. There's, yeah. No, there's no question about mm-hmm. that. Now, now look, the, because communists are hypocrites and liars, they would say, oh, no, 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 no. We we let people go to church or whatever. It's baloney. That That's what I remember Hillary Clinton. This has got to be like 15 years ago. She used the phrase freedom of worship, not freedom of religion. Of religion. Mm-hmm. Not religious liberty, but freedom of worship. Now, freedom of worship is worthless. It means, like in China, they say, hey, you can go into that building on Sunday morning and do your little weird rituals. But when you come out of that building, when you're done, you're doing your little worship. Mm -hmm. Now you bow to the secular authority of the state. Freedom of religion, religious liberty means 
when I come out of that building, I am free to live out my faith in every sphere, in the marketplace, in the whatever. That's what the founders wanted to happen. It's not verboten. So we have to be careful when people start using that phrase, freedom of worship, because freedom of worship, they have that in China. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say, oh, no, we've got churches. We've got to go. But the moment you want to have real faith, they will crush you. And that's why we need to understand what we have here is not exactly normal. And it is very fragile. And if we don't know what it is and protect it and love it and thank God for it, it will go away. Amen. I am so thrilled to have you here. I, I, I will try and come full circle and, and land this plane because we would told you we'd only take an hour. Um, Skip and I <laughs> had the privilege of going to the kingdom to be in Saudi Arabia last September. Right. And so now uh, we're entering a country that is... Muslim, right? It's Islam. It is the keeper of Islam. You know, it's where Medina and Mecca are. And so you know, it, that, it's enforced Islam. Correct. Yeah. That's like, like, just to be we clear. We couldn't even go to Medina. Like as non-believers, we, yeah. yeah, we go there, we die. You know, it's yeah. really, really, it's so, yeah. so it's really intense and they're still hijab and the robes and all the things. And so really it's amazing that um, Saudi Arabia is about to open its borders to foreigners and different religions. They really want to, they're starting to do archeological digs and, you know, they're really going to try and redeem their reputation in the world. Whole nother conversation. But um, I was there with a group of evangelicals, and each of us were representing different thoughts that we wanted to be able to communicate. We got to meet Mohammed bin Salman. As a matter of fact, we were invited to the palace, and I met his uh, cousin, uh, Princess Rama, who is our the first person to represent, to be the ambassador from Saudi Arabia to the United States. Right. And uh, so as I was meeting different women and uh, very religious hijab clothed, I said, well, what would you like me to tell women in the West. How, how can I represent you? What would you like me, you know, to try and build a bridge? And this one woman, oh, I just love what she said to me. She said, I want you to go back and tell women there, we don't want freedom from religion. We want freedom of religion. And when she framed it like that, she's saying, look, don't tell me that I can't believe what I want to believe that I don't want freedom from this. Don't come and try and take my hijab away if this is my right. my uh, religion, my faith, if you will, coming back to this, what is this faith? The faith makes virtue, et cetera, et cetera, if, if that's what she wants to believe. And I think that's kind of the critical place we are here. I don't want freedom from religion. If mm-hmm. someone tried to tell me I was, you know, patriarchal and that mm-hmm. I was provincial and that my, you know, poor abused woman that I'm letting, you know— I don't want freedom from that. I want freedom of it. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to continue to practice that in the United States. And so I don't know. It's kind of funny because it makes me think that all this stuff lately has been making me think of Kanye West when he starts saying, like, I've been told that if I don't vote this way, I have to vote this way. I have to think this. And he said, you know what? No, I'm going to think for myself. I'm going to dare to think for myself. He took a lot of heat Mm -hmm. for that. But if we do not have that kind of courage to say, like, come at me, I don't care. I am free. I, I was crucified with Christ. I'm dead. You can't kill me. I, I am free. I'm going to think for myself. I'm going to speak the truth in love. We need to model that, basically. Yeah. We all need to model that in our families or whatever. It doesn't mean it's going to go smoothly all the time. But if we don't get serious about that and start appreciating that, what we have is an amazing gift. This freedom we have is an amazing gift. If we don't, if we don't use it, it goes away. God will give it to somebody else, you know, or it will go away forever, and He'll just come back. And a lot of people, go, oh, I'm fine with that. Well, if that's God's plan, I'm fine with that. But if it's His plan that we fight for His purposes, that we could have an end time revival of a billion Amen. souls, Amen. then we need to we need to stay and do what He calls us to do. It's good. Mm-hmm. It's good. It goes back to the verse in John: "If the world hates you, remember that they hated me first. I think there's a courage that has to come from this—a courage to speak your mind in a world where, when I'm growing up, right now, the sphere, the perspective is so twisted. It's so twisted that I struggle with speaking my mind, and yeah. it's something that I have really fought to do. Um, and that's why I am where I am, is because." I just continue fighting and it makes people really uncomfortable and I receive a lot of criticism, but you have to push through and remember that God has overcome. The enemy wants you to stay silent and it just goes back to Jesus. It's funny because something has happened to you're too young, Lindsay, to know this. But, you know, when Christians began to get involved in politics and like in the early 80s, something really good happened. Right. Because Christians start saying, hey, my faith is supposed to be everywhere in how I vote, in how I live, and it's supposed to be everywhere. So the idea that I should keep it out of politics, first of all, 
how can you keep it out of politics? Mm-hmm. I mean, if slavery is a, is a, on the ballot, am I not required to fight for, for truth and justice? And, you know, that that's it's inevitable. Right. Mm-hmm. So if Bonhoeffer's in Nazi Germany or Wilberforce is, is in uh, in Great Britain and they have slavery. In other words, your, your faith is supposed to inform your whole life. And sometimes yeah. that means politics. Mm-hmm. But what happened is that the kind of culture war and the, the religious right and whatever it it didn't really work out so great, let's say. It's like it was it's kind of complicated. And at some point, a lot of Christians said, you know what? I don't like this. I'm going to stay out of politics and I'm just going to, quote unquote, preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. And they bought a lie because there is no such thing as only preaching the gospel. If I preach the gospel, it means that I'm going to have to speak up for truth wherever I see truth. It means I'm going to have to say socialism hurts people. If you really care about the poor, you need to understand socialism actually hurts the poor. Now, mm-hmm. if you want a virtue signal, if you want all your friends to think you're cool mm-hmm. and you care about the poor and you say you're a socialist, whatever. OK, but if you actually care about the poor, not about your friends, but about the poor, you understand that a capitalist system is the way you can decrease poverty. You can get people out of poverty. That's what's going to be. Once you begin to understand this stuff, you realize, how is my faith? If I'm supposed to care for the poor, how am I going to be a political Unfortunately, sometimes I have to be political. And so I I, I say to people, yeah. you cannot avoid this. And by the way, if you think you can, you're kidding yourself. Mm-hmm. You, you're you going to have to understand that sometimes we have to be involved in politics. If, if I care about a poor kid in the ghetto, that means I'm going to have to think about how I vote. And I'm going to have to vote not so that people say like, hey, you voted the, the way I think you should vote. You, you have to vote the way you think God wants you to vote to pick some imperfect person to put in place policies to help that poor kid Amen. and to help everybody and stuff. So this this idea that Christians could say, I'm just going to preach the gospel, that's baloney. And by the way, usually it really means that they're just going to be left wing politically, yes. like they're going to go with that stuff. But all the stuff that costs something like talking about the unborn or talking about uh, traditional marriage or the, anything that costs, they're going to be, oh, that's political. But they're going to have no problem talking about social justice and stuff. So it, it's just kind of silly politics and faith are inextricably intertwined. And, yeah. you know, we're not, we're never supposed to make an idol of politics, God forbid. And we talked about we, both of them here on all the things. Yeah. I know. Well, Religion and, and politics. Yeah. I feel all like and, we could talk forever. Yes. It would be amazing. Uh, what are you doing next week? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this once a week. But we will close out because we know you're on a timeline to speak here at Calvary Albuquerque. But let's close out with a couple questions. So my husband and I know that you have interviewed Ravi Zacharias, who is one of our just all-time favorites. Who are your top three interviews if you had to choose you know i really i've interviewed so many people you would think i'd have an answer to this but you don't that's okay (laughs) i do not have a clue i have interviewed so many different types of people that i enjoy each one like we're saying in the beginning i'm really eclectic so i enjoy each one in a different way and that's why i do my you know radio tv program and the youtube stuff because i think that there are some people that they're going to love this guest but they're going to not be interested at all in this guest Mm -hmm. so i try to do it i I just try to do it. So that that is really tough. I have had a few that have just been a, like a lot of fun. Um, some of them, it's not fun at all. It's just like really serious and important and stuff. So I, I'm i just sitting here thinking I have no answer. But that's a good thing that you've interviewed so many cool people with so many intelligent and just different people that yeah. you don't have a choice. Okay, next question. Books you're currently reading or a favorite book? Um, I, I love... I love C.S. Lewis, generally speaking, mm-hmm. but I haven't been reading him lately. What have I been reading? I wrote a book. I read a book called uh, Gentleman in Moscow, which is one of the finest novels I've ever read. And I interviewed mm-hmm. the author. His name is Amor Tolls on my radio program. And mm-hmm. I recommend that if people are just looking for, for a read of fiction, mm-hmm. just fiction. But it also kind of takes a stand with regard to communism and the yes. Moscow. It's kind of interesting, but it, it is truly brilliant. And I don't say that lightly, mm-hmm. uh, but that book, a Gentleman in Moscow, and and that interview that I had with him, I'm going to have him back on, by the way. And then recently I interviewed a guy named Scott Johnston. He wrote a book called Campus Land. Mm-hmm. It is brilliant and utterly hilarious. It is a send up of the politically correct madness on campuses, but it is genius and funny. Uh, I'm reading it right now and we're going to have him back on the show. Once I'm done with the book, I had him on, but now when I'm done with the book, I'm going to have him back on to talk about it. So I don't read a lot of contemporary fiction, but in this case, those are two contemporary books that I have read. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us, Eric. 
For behind the scenes videos and photos, as well as info about our upcoming guests, follow along with us on Instagram at allthethings.podcast. You can keep up with Lenya at at Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay at at Lindsay.maestas. If you'd like to listen to past episodes or learn more about us, visit the allthethingspodcast.com.